Thank you, Dr. Gwynn, Dr. McDowell, for inviting me to come and talk to you guys. Um, I don't understand why you do it at 12 noon. All right, I mean, so how many of you guys have eaten? How many have not eaten? See, I'm doomed either way. If you've eaten, you're going to fall asleep and have a siesta on me. If not, you just can't wait to get to get your food, right? So, uh, well, I've eaten. I don't get to take a nap, so you guys stay with me, hopefully, a little bit. How much time do I have? You'll have till uh, about 1250. He cut me short already. I knew I was cutting it close with 50 minutes. But take as much time as you want to they need to leave the If they start leaving and falling asleep, I know to quit. Uh, I want to commend you guys. I'm mean, really here. I know I might have others that are not in the engineering discipline. Uh, hey, you can always come over to the engineering discipline. It doesn't, doesn't hurt. But I'm really here to talk to you more about the engineering side of things. And I commend you for taking on the discipline and pursuing an engineering degree. It can be difficult. It can be challenging. But it can also be very rewarding. And. Uh, there's really three areas that I want to discuss with you, and I was talking to Mr. Gwynn about what I wanted to talk about, and uh, you know, I look at what interest uh, a student has, and you know, your vision out is really about, boy, I got to graduate first. So, uh, but I think a couple things that I want to hit upon, and kind of be the theme of what I'm going to talk about, is three things. Really, number one, we talk about a degree, we talk about a profession and a job, but it's really, in my mind, about a calling. What is your calling? What has God called you to do? Number two, in the engineering field, you might think of engineering, what is it? Sitting at a desk, designing something, creating something, and is that all it's about? And my answer is no. And that's what uh, Dr. Gwynn was mentioning a little bit. My career has spanned many different areas and disciplines, but at heart was the background of my mechanical engineering degree was critical in really allowing me to do what I've done in a variety of areas. And, and three is really looking at where does God use you? What, what is the... What is the area in which you feel God can use you and that you can be, really, where is a mission field? And a lot of us, I think, look at that, struggle with it, and we think of a mission field maybe in Haiti, in Nicaragua, in Honduras. Well, I can tell you this. You know, I've got roughly 1,000 employees directly working with me. I've got another 2,500 franchises uh, that we work with. And if 3,500 people is not a mission field, then I don't know what is. And so there's a variety of areas that you can really pursue. I think the will of God in what you do, nothing to take away from the missions out there in the rest of the world and across the country. But right where you're at is a great place to be looking and working in, in for the missions for, for the Lord. But in really telling this, I'm going to kind of go back a little bit. I'm going to I'm going to tell my story, and I think it's a better way to do it by just going through 30 years. So guess what? we got about, what, 30 minutes to go through 30 years. So I'm not going to try to go too fast uh, with you guys, but uh, keep it engaging. But I want to look at 30 years as a mechanical engineer and what it, you know, what it really meant to me and how it allowed me to do what I did and where we are today. A little bit of history. I grew up in the Midwest. I came from the plains of the Dakotas and Iowa, so I can relate to your bison out front. I was a, uh, always had a love for the American buffalo or the bison. Uh, and I grew up, I was born in South Dakota. I was raised in a small town, Sibley, Iowa, up in the northwest corner of Iowa. And uh, grew up in the country, so I'm a very outdoors person. I like to hunt and fish and spend time outdoors. Went to school, uh, graduate, went to school, college, uh, undergrad was from South Dakota State University in Brookings, South Dakota. And initially I wanted to, I thought I wanted to be a civil engineer. And the reason is I love the outdoors. Uh, and I thought, oh, you know, doing the things outdoors, doing all the I, dams and designing and, and surveying. But I realized that there was a, another part of me that liked to build things. I love to build things. Um, and more around the side, I've loved flying as well. So aviation is kind of rich in my blood. And I realized quickly, uh, before I actually got started my freshman year, that mechanical engineering was really probably the right thing for me. And it really was. Uh, you know, I think, and, I, and again, growing up, I love to build things. And I think building things is really a God thing. I mean, you think about it. Uh, God created the heavens and the earth, he created six days, he rested on the seventh. I mean, if you think about it, God was the ultimate engineer. All right? 
And what I look at is I think God has instilled in many of us the desire to build things, to create things. I think he wants us to do that. So again, looking at the engineering profession, I see it as a very admirable profession. One in which this country and the world needs. What we have and what we develop is really around, a lot of it is the engineering and science part of things as to what we are creating for the well-being of, 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 the, of the people of the world. So anyway, I went to South Dakota State University, mechanical engineering. Uh, at the end of my sophomore year, uh, there was a program called the NUPOC program. It was a nuclear program for the Navy had out to, uh, for uh, nuclear engineers to, uh, for basically to, for submarines and carriers. I was selected to teach nuclear power uh, at nuclear power school, and I was uh, selected to teach the physics, nuclear physics, and then I got into core dynamics, which is basically the more the dynamics of the, the physics of what's going on in a nuclear reactor. I did that for four years. And during that time, uh, my love for aviation kind of came back, and I wanted to build a plane. So when I was 27 years old, while I was in the Navy, I took on a project to build an airplane. Three and a half years. Uh, 2,580 hours later, uh, I had built a plane, a little two-place, pretty fast aerodynamic, uh, aerobatic uh, aircraft, and it was quite a thrill. It was quite a thrill to get into a plane and fly it for the first time, something that you had spent almost four years building. Uh, a little scary, a little concerning, but I thank God I had that mechanical engineering background. It does help along the way. So again, I want you to see that there are a number of areas that you can use the education that you get here in your profession and outside of your profession. I was with the Navy for four years, basically. In 1990, uh, I joined McDonnell Douglas Space Systems out of Huntsville, Alabama, and I was a thermal fluids engineer for them. I did that for four years, from 1990 to 1994. Uh, that is where I'd say I really was doing engineering work, in a sense. I had a desk, I was in the design team, as, as well as part of my job was keeping the astronauts alive uh, while they're on mission. So I had to keep them in the oxygen and keep them out of carbon dioxide, carbon monoxide, make sure we got rid of all the waste products that were produced or they'd, they'd die, poison them. So that is what I did for four years, but I felt God's calling on me was not to do that kind of work. He had more for me. Uh, at McDonnell Douglas during those years, I actually saw two layoffs that we had. And it was, it was really difficult for me to see folks that were older folks that were like in their 50s, uh, you know, where I am now, literally being escorted out the door as they did layoffs. I said, you know, this isn't really the place for me. I think God's telling me someplace else to go and to do something else. I literally went through two layoffs in the company and said it's time for me to move on. I didn't get laid off, but I quit. And I started my own company. I started a company and I had a friend that offered up an office space and I rented about 5,000 square feet next to it and I started a company. I quit on a Friday and I started my own business on a Monday. And what I had was a desk and a phone and nothing else. And I had a fairly new wife, no children yet. Uh, but I had to make a living. And I'm just going to give you a quick little story here. And it's about a, the variety of things that you might need to do, if you need to, uh, to make things work. And when you start a company, and, and that's also one other thing I want to highlight. If there's one bit of recommendation. People say, you know, how do you, how do you become successful? I'll tell you this. You work hard. Well, people go, oh, yeah, you work hard. You dig ditches. You, yeah, you work hard. You work smart. And then you work hard some more. That's what it really takes to really be successful, in my mind. Working hard, working smart, and then working hard. In those early years, I got a couple little, the first year, I didn't have a lot of business. And uh, we were looking at any way that we could make, I was looking at any way I could make money. And I realized I needed some office furniture. So I looked around and found a McDonnell Douglas, the company I worked for, had had a five-year lease on equipment. And they were giving that up, and they said, uh, we're giving that equipment up, about $100,000 worth of equipment. I said, well, I just need a couple of desks and a couple of chairs, but I'll buy the whole bunch. Bought the whole bunch, sold it, put it out there and sold it. Now we use eBay. We didn't have that back then uh, or Craigslist. Uh, but I sold that and uh, made a little bit of money, made about $20,000. That's what I needed. Just in contrast to that, 
in contrast to that, at that time, there was a program called the AIT program, Anti-Intercept Technology Program. It was a kinetic kill missile uh, developed really to take out uh, incoming, mainly Russian nuclear missiles uh, with a kinetic kill. Lockheed Martin was bidding for that work, and uh, I got a call from Lockheed Martin only about five months into sitting at that desk in my, and, and, and my, my phone, not that I wasn't pursuing things, and they said, can we, uh, we hear you uh, do composites. Well, I had built an airplane. They said, can we come and see you? They came to see me, and I had two men sitting there in front of me at my desk and uh, vice president of engineering design. And they said, this is our problem. We've got two parts that we've had being worked on by uh, another um, composite company uh, on the West Coast, and they can't deliver two parts for us. It's called the tetracone and the midsection, the difficult pieces of this missile, because they had to take high temperatures, because uh, they were, again, a kinetic kill, traveling thousands of miles per hour and building up a lot of heat. And I said, they said, what do you have to show us that you can do this job? I said, I really don't have much to show you. But I said, well, we heard you built an airplane. I said, I did build an airplane. We headed out to the hangar. They looked at my plane, and they said, you know what? If you did this, we think you can do that. I ended up getting that job, getting that contract. I built three tetracones, three midsections. My, uh, Lockheed Martin ended up winning a $400 million contract. That was a, quite a bit of money 20-some years ago. And uh, over the parts that we delivered to them, and uh, I made about $20,000. I made about $20,000 out on that and used furniture. But you know what? You got to do what you got to do when you have to do it. Now, I would have never gotten that Lockheed contract had it not been for my engineering background. Convincing some engineers that we could do the job, and we did do the job. And it delivered to them, and they got the contract. So that was kind of the beginning. My company I started back then was called Advanced Composites Technology. We quickly recognized we needed to move to protective coatings. There was an area we needed to protect the composites that we were designing and making. And that's how I really fell into the line of Line X. And needing a thick build protective coating, so I changed the name of the company to Advanced Protective Coatings and got involved with Linux on the early stages, working with, working with a company called Burton Chemical out of California. We developed some of the first polyurethane, polyurea uh, molecule, molecular uh, products that we used in a number of different areas, and we realized they'd work probably well in the truck bed side of things as well. So that's where we got started, and then we started the franchise system uh, with Linux and started developing and growing from that standpoint. Uh, Couple things, one thing I want to say about that is in that process, we were developing those, that chemistry. Um, I want to fast forward a little bit to about 1999, 2000. We were contacted by Air Force Research Labs and um, the Corps of Army Corps of Engineers. And they said, listen, some of our chemists and our physicists have been playing with some of your molecules that make up this, this polyurethane, polyurea. And we find that they do kind of unique things. And I said, well, they do. Uh, in fact, uh, they actually can take a lot of energy. They're very robust and uh, durable. And they said, yeah, we think they can do kind of some neat things with bomb blast mitigation. I'm going to grab a couple samples here for you real quick, too, uh, just to pass around. If I could, would you mind just, you can just kind of spread these out around there, if you don't mind. I'm going to hand out a, a product. It's called XS350. Uh, it's a pure polyurea. It's probably one of the strongest uh, products in the polyurethane, polyurea industry side. Just take it and bend it a little bit. Kind of unique about that. It looks a lot like what we'd put in the back of your bed. It's pretty close, but a little, there's some differences to it. That product you can take and stretch to two to three times. Uh, it doesn't feel elastomeric, but it is. Two to three times what you've got there with elongation. It also absorbs a tremendous amount of energy. So that's really what the Corps of Engineers and the Air Force Research Labs were looking at when they were looking at our product. And uh, I went to a couple of tests at, uh, at the Air Force Base Research Labs, and we went underground, we did the bomb blast, and it was amazing what that product would do. And uh, that's where we really got into the bomb, bomb the more of the military side of what we do with our products. Uh, one area I want to look at, we, uh, 
We went through testing on this product for about a year with Air Force Research Labs and the Army Corps of Engineers. In August, the end of August of 2001, the final report came out to the Defense uh, Department that this was the product that we needed to be using in blast mitigation. Less than two weeks later, 9-11 uh, happened. And uh, as you know, the Pentagon was hit on the northwest side uh, where the jet went in to. Uh, the phone started ringing off the hook. We understand you were just approved by Air Force Research Labs and Army for a product that's new. Uh, it's got some really kind of neat characteristics and uh, we'd like to see you. So I was boots on the ground in the Pentagon, uh, literally while there was still smoke rising up from the floor as we went into that north side that was hit on the Pentagon by the airliner. Ironically, that was the side, the only side of the Pentagon that had just finished renovation with blast mitigation. Not our product, but some other products. So that actually saved a bunch of lives. I believe 150 or 180, I can't remember exact number, of folks in the Pentagon were killed. But due to the fact it was being renovated, a whole lot fewer people were in there and the fact that the structure held together a lot longer than it would have had had it been any other of the other four sides. The race to protect America is being led by a growing U.S. company that's better known for its spray-on truck bedliners. Southern California-based Linex Corporation makes a U.S. government-approved blast-proof paint that's sprayed onto buildings. The product now protects the walls of the U.S. Pentagon, the Washington Naval Base, and the federal building in downtown New York. New Mexico Tech's Explosive Research Center recently conducted the latest round of tests on this new product. We've got an office setting with somebody in it. This is an exact duplicate of the other room. The explosive charge contains 200 pounds of TNT and 5 pounds of C4. itself has been decapitated and we certainly have complete failure in this room. Building fragmentation causes over 80 percent of the casualties in a bomb blast. The protected wall remains intact and the interior is undisturbed. With all the talk about terror prevention, Linex is one company that's taking action to address the issue. It's really, this was a very, very small blast. When I did the test with Air Force Research Labs, we had to go underground and it was in a very remote area. It was a huge blast. And the physicists were amazed what happened. The, uh, that material that you're holding would be a little thicker typically on an application like this, but it would literally stretch to three and four feet and maintain integrity. And then it would come back. And again, the neat thing about that, the neat properties is that you've got those chemical, those basically carbon, oxygen, hydrogen bonds that are long molecules that stretch in that process, absorbing a tremendous amount of the energy and dissipating it so it doesn't really go into the uh, occupied space. And that's what we really have here. That's what interested was of interest, again, on the Pentagon, that the exterior walls, we ended up spraying all of the inside of the exterior wall of the Pentagon. And it's a huge building. It's a huge building. It's a multi-year program. So now our Pentagon is protected with our product line. Basically this product just thicker and with a few other things that we added to it. Uh, this was just there as we were doing the project. Again, a lot of pride in building back our Pentagon after that attack on 9-11. Those guys were working night and day to get this north side back into place and we were on the inside spraying these walls. That's me when I was younger, off to the right. And that's actually the first wall we sprayed. And I actually brought a little bit of history with me. This chunk right here is actually right off of right here. This is actually out of the Pentagon. And uh, I took it with me when I left. I figured I deserve to own at least that part since I sprayed this. Um, <laughs> They were concerned about the bonding. They said, great product, we see what it does, as you see in the video, but it's got to bond to the surfaces. Guys, that Pentagon was built in 16 months, 1941 to 1943. 
They built that Pentagon a lot like I think God created the earth. They didn't even finish the design. The contract was awarded, and the day the contract was awarded, they started work on the Pentagon. They had to fill it because we were involved in World War II with Pearl Harbor happening just months after they started the Pentagon. They had to start working in the Pentagon in some of the inner rings as they finished them while they worked on the outer. The construction process of the Pentagon got ahead of the design work. And that's the way they did it. So the bottom line is, when we went in there and we worked, did it bond? I actually took with me the mortar and the brick that these guys laid in there back in 1941. The high strength concrete tore it apart as we peeled this off the walls. And these were the brick, and most of the soldiers that built the Pentagon, most of the guys that built the Pentagon ended up fighting in World War II. But anyway, you guys can look at this afterwards. This was the inside we sprayed. A lot's been done to this. That's why it looks burned and, and so forth. Don't worry, it didn't go through the mess. It was just testing that we did on it. But it literally took the wall right off as we peeled it off. It, it did that. So they were pleased with the bonding, and we were awarded that project. You can take a look at that if you'd like. Next slide, please. That's one characteristic of the product we've got. That's blast mitigation. The other was spalling. And this is really more ballistics. And I want to go ahead and show you. When we have, and we did a lot of work with the military. This is more, again, in, when we got into Iraq and Afghanistan. When you have high strength steel, it's fairly brittle. And when it takes a high impact round, you'll get spalling. And many times, if I'd be standing here and a bullet hit here, you might think you're in good shape. You're not. Many times it would make it take a multiple kill. The spalling off this would kill me and probably kill anybody that was next to me as well. And it's the fragmentation that happens not only of the bullet, but also of that steel. You get scaling effect off that steel. So this was another area the military wanted to look at. So if I could, let's go. This was uh, some testing that will show you the spalling effect. This would be a 223. I like that'd be a 223, right? An M16? So it'd be a 223 bullet, about 2,500. There you see the, the hit. Some fragments, but also of the bullet, but you also saw some of the metal from the high strength steel. All right, the next is gonna be a little different profile. This is the projectile coming in from about this angle. Again, around 2,300 feet per second. Go ahead, next video. Next is gonna be, there it went. It's, the bullet's coming in here, we'll show it again. All the fragmentation was contained by our product. This is high strength steel, and we've got basically the thickness of the product you had in your hand on each side of that plate. That's what protected our troops on the Humvees and the vehicles is around the turrets and so forth for machine guns. Those are high strength steel. We coated all of those. A lot of the military work we did uh, with that product. Again, containing fragmentation. Next one, please. This is another area we did. A little different, not fragmentation. These are actually breastplates and back plates that all of our soldiers wore in the war. They were a ceramic, kind of a fluffy, I call it fluffy ceramic. Uh, it was, it, it had a blowing agent in it. It was actually a ceramic plate, but it was very, very brittle. We coated all of this because the ceramic plate could take a hit, and that's it. Couldn't take two. It would blow the par a piece apart. So the, the first hit, it would stop the bullet. Second bullet was going through. Sergeant was hit twice, once here and once there. And again, this is all coded in our product. This is him presenting this to uh, Defense Secretary Rumsfeld. Uh, that, that breastplate saved his life. And uh, that's another, we coded every one of those for every soldier in a Afghanistan and Iraq. So three different areas of which we used our product in the military. You know, we, we are involved in a lot of different things with Lion. It's, it, it's fun. It's exciting. We, uh, we work with different groups. Uh, again, we work with uh, the Untouchables. We work with Trick Your Truck, um, West Coast Customs. We did a Camaro. I'll show you a picture of that in just a minute of what we're doing in some different areas. And uh, this one is actually some video of Nat Geo. It shows some kind of neat characteristics of the products we make and, uh, and uh, how they hold up under different circumstances. So if you don't mind, you can go ahead and roll that real quick, let you watch that. Contender number two, Steve Decker says, Line X can't be beat. I'm Steve Decker, Vice President of Business Development for Linex. Linex started out by just coating the back of pickup trucks, but we quickly realized that we were only limited by our imagination. 
Linex is a polyurea spray that turns solid in under five seconds, creating a super protective layer. The U.S. Defense Department uses Linex to protect buildings such as the Pentagon from potential bomb blasts. It can actually hold walls together due to its combination of strength and flexibility. The potential for Linex is absolutely limitless. Linex coatings are 300% tougher than other coatings in the market. Not only has high impact, but could also flex and stretch without breaking. Linex as a spray coating has the ability to protect objects from incredible impact. It didn't take much convincing to get Steve and Terry to show us what happens when four everyday items get tossed off a roof. Each item is more fragile than the last, and they all smash into pieces. Now, we're gonna spray identical items with an eighth inch coating of Line X. Will it save them from destruction? And this is going to simulate what could happen if we have a building that's protected with Line X in the event of a bomb blast. We are about to find out if just an eighth of an inch of Linex is strong enough to keep a cinder block from smashing to bits. And this is going to simulate what could happen if we have a building that's protected with Linex in the event of a bomb blast. The thin Linex coating creates an elastic barrier that makes this block as impact resistant as a rubber ball. And this plate survives without even a chip. But what about the egg? The most fragile of them all. It's elastomeric, meaning it can stretch and absorb the energy rather than breaking and tearing, and it goes back to its original shape. About 300 pounds more gravitas to be exact, which is about to bear down on these two 16 ounce plastic cups. No surprise there. But with just a fraction of an inch of Linex coating, will the cups be able to support the weight of our 300 pound sumo wrestler? It seems impossible. But in fact, pound for pound, Linex makes any surface five times stronger than steel, making this heavyweight fella, well, light as a bird. We've seen that Linex can resist impact velocity and withstand massive amounts of weight. Remember that watermelon we sprayed down? This is a watermelon covered in Linex. How thick is this? Oh, roughly an eighth of an inch. Only an eighth of an inch. Uh -huh. And am I to hit that with this hammer? Absolutely. And will this stop my force? Absolutely. Safety first. Try these oh, okay. on. Because this is going to protect my genitals. Okay. Thanks, guys. <laughs> This is flexible. So how do we feel? Confident? Very confident. You see a few things that we do. We have fun too. Uh, you probably, any of you seen us, uh, we've had some episodes on Mythbusters. Seen some of the, any of you guys seen those? Mythbusters and some of the blast, kind of the same kind of thing. But uh, there's our Camaro. Uh, that's what we did actually with uh, Ryan and crew at uh, uh, West Coast Customs. Uh, we designed that and we still have it on, actually on tour. It goes kind of around the country for different things. We're gonna be auctioning it off uh, probably for wounded warriors here in the fall with a Barrett's uh, auction house. We'll get to that as kind of a nicely done, fully coated 
uh, Linux with some different products that we've got. Um, what I wanted to show you basically is a variety of things that you can, you know, get involved with, be involved in, and do. You know, you look again at engineering and what it really means. Does it mean you're just sitting at a design desk? No, not necessarily at all. You know, my 30 years now as a mechanical engineer has led me in a variety of different areas, and I've really enjoyed uh, the path that it has allowed me to take. Uh, gives you a variety of uh, a, a wide range and a base of knowledge that you use in and outside of business. You know, you really look at the discipline that we learn in engineering. It's about designing things well, strong, efficient, better, and you can apply that even outside the physical realm. You know, I've got to look at a business side of things and how do we run more efficiently, more effectively. How do we build things, uh, both from the physical side or the chemistry side, as well as just a structural side to the business itself, which has really, I think, allowed us to lead to a very successful, uh, a successful business with Linex. Less than three months ago, and just, again, kind of showing you the variety. There's times I'm an engineer, and there's many times I'm not. Uh, I'm a CEO. You saw, saw up there two of my vice presidents that I have. They're still with us. I have 14 uh, vice presidents, an exe executive vice president, and one president of our Canadian division that work uh, with me. Uh, but uh, those guys, too, have been you know, involved. Some of them are engineers. Some of them are chemists. Some of them are not. But uh, again, a, a wide range of things that you can get involved in and be involved in. It's just not, you know, per se, sitting at a desk and designing something. Less than three months ago, Less than three months ago, I was uh, in New York City, just to give you a little bit of taste of variety, and uh, we were basically through the process of selling the company. Uh, it was called New York City Park Avenue, financial district of the world, as I stood in a room waiting to give a presentation to roughly 60 bankers uh, in a conference room. And uh, as I sat there, I had my uh, CFO and my president of the Canadian division as we sat there and we had to present to all the major, uh, many of the major banks of the world from Chicago, New York, London, Montreal, from Ireland, Bank of Ireland, we had them all there. And uh, we went in there and uh, presented to over a hundred folks. We had to raise basically tens or hundreds of millions of dollars to finance this deal. And uh, we went in there, we had two and a half hours to do it. We were either gonna be successful or not. And uh, two and a half hours later, we had shown those bankers the level of excitement and energy about this company uh, that uh, we got all the financing and more that was needed for the acquisition of the company. And I thought, guys, when we went into this room, I said, here you go, it's showtime. This is the time of which we gotta let it all go. And you know what, the engineering side, the whatever side you've got behind you, the years of experience, but really that background is what gave me you know, the edge gives us the edge in getting some of these deals done and doing these things. So uh, that's where we were three months ago. A private equity group, I still own part of uh, Linux with a private equity group out of uh, New York and I'm still involved, still working as the CEO of the company. Um, and I thought just giving you guys the example, kind of going through 30 years, letting you guys see the example of my story. But folks, this story is really not about me. This story is really about you. You know, and what I look at is maybe 10 years, 20 years, 30 years from now, uh, maybe running into some of you, and you guys saying, hey, Kevin, remember when, you know, you, got, you were there, you presented at Lipscomb, and you were telling me, follow my calling, and that there's opportunity, and that there's a, there's, there's, it might be tough, it might be difficult getting this degree, and what does it show, what can I do with it? And listen, I followed the calling of God, and I have been, I have used my skills and my abilities to further the kingdom of God, and I've been rewarded with that. That's what I'd want to see. So don't limit yourself. Don't limit yourself in the thinking of what you can do with this degree, with this education, with the discipline. Uh, a lot of different areas, a lot of the different things you can do, but seek out the calling. Remember, God has made you individual. He has made you for you to take on. What is that call? What is it that God wants me to do with my skills, my abilities? And then work hard and achieve. And you can achieve many things. Thanks for having me today. I'll be around if there's any questions. I'll be
We've got, we do have a few minutes if anybody's got a question they'd like to ask you. Yeah? Well, I've got one. Did you ever cut the watermelon open after you hit it with the sledgehammer? It was a mess. Yeah, okay. It was a mess, yeah. Some of those blocks are also a little bit uh, flimsier after they drop yeah. three or four times as well. So. Yeah, after they're all held together. Yeah, after, yeah we, didn't, we didn't eat the watermelon, nor the egg. I, I didn't break the egg open. We couldn't break that one open, but uh, the watermelon was a mess. So. We actually know we, we did it, uh, Scott. We uh, it, it does doesn't it doesn't have any fingerprints. And we've had a lot of shows and we have no dings or scratches, so that's a good thing. But that's all we've really done with that. We don't guarantee crash testing things, okay, with vehicles. So don't get any any ideas. We do spray a lot of vehicles, the whole exterior vehicles, just not the Camaro trucks included, and it helps in abrasion and so forth, and dings and bangs, but not crash resistant. We won't go that far. I don't want the liability of that. Question. Have you ever coated a, uh, like a truck ladder frame to do twist resistance? We have not. I have not done ladder frames for, tist, for twist resistance. We haven't done that. Not that we couldn't. We sprayed a lot of things. I, haven't, I don't remember spraying anything like that. Any other questions? Yeah. Do, uh, do scratches show up on that easily? No. Scratches do not show up on it hardly at all. In fact, we almost call them self-healing. Literally, in the back of a truck, you can get a lot of things. If you're, again, uh, something on a, a, a tote or a, a, a drug in or through, it might have a nail hanging out. A lot of times, it sort of seems to self-heal itself. So, now, you know, again, you can get in there with a, a forklift and gouge something out, but uh, really resist scratches and so forth. That's like I said, that Camaro looks like the day we sprayed it. We've had it at many different shows. Question? Excuse me? Oh, good question. What happens if it gets on your skin? You, it's a little hot. It goes on a little warm, so it doesn't really burn you, but it feels a little warm. But then it doesn't come off very easy. So uh, you usually just you peel at it or you wear it off. The idea is you're in a full suit and you don't get it on your skin. That's the hope. But, we, but I've done it many a time, and usually I just got, it, it rubs off. Months, years. <laughs> it takes a while. I always tell people, no, no, I'm not going to tell that story. <laughs> Question. Uh, does it happen a lot of times that a customer will come to you with a way they want to use it and a new application that you hadn't really thought of? It's a good question. People come to me with new ideas and new applications and they answer all the time. Uh, many things over 20 years of doing this business, we've sprayed many different things and we kind of know, but there's always the ladders we haven't. But uh, in, in some places, and, and what we got to really really figure out is does it have a commercial application that is drivable to you know for our franchisees to make money with but you know it does have many applications just might be one-offs and we do our franchisees we have roughly 400 franchises across the US and, and, and uh, Canada and uh, they've sprayed many many different things I don't even know everything that's been sprayed but we every day it seems we have new ideas coming to us question you look like you were going to raise, you wanted to raise your hand, didn't you? Yeah. So, uh, when you spray this on stuff, does it change the texture? Uh, does it change? When we spray that on, we spray it smooth, and then usually we texture afterwards. That's a process we do. Uh, but that texture comes by the spraying process. Uh, otherwise, we can spray it smooth. As you'll see here, this is pretty smooth. So, we can spray it either way. But we give it texture for the aesthetic side just to make it look good, but we don't have to doesn't add anything other than aesthetics. That answer your question? Or were you talking about what I spray? Does it, it doesn't really do anything to the product that I spray, the, the substrate that I spray it doesn't do anything to that but warm it up. Okay. Question? Can it be made to look as good as automotive acrylic paint? Can it be made to look as good as our acrylic paint? No, it, it can't. And part of the reason is it just sets up so quickly. I do have some products that come close and we, we do have the, the thick build product sets up and has to set up within seconds, literally one, two. This 350 product that I pass around is about a, about a second and a half gel time. And it's so I can build up thickness on walls and overhead without it drooping, sagging, and staying uniform. And in your truck beds, even with our what we call our XS100 product, to keep that same thick. You don't want droops and sags like some of our competing, competing products. You'll see droops and sags. All right, too slow. 
So that's why we can't, but we do have some other slower products that give it time to flow out. Those are actually, what you've got in your hand is actually a, a called a pure polyurea. It's a chemistry of an MDI isocyanate and a polyol, uh, main, mainly a propylene-based polyols. And they come together 50% 50, 50 by volume. We mix them and they set up within seconds. That's the way a lot of our, what we call our thick build polyurethane, polyurea products work. And again, it's a fast exothermic <laughs> reaction. Good question. Prep work is critical. A product that you're spraying is only as good as the bonding that you get, and the military knew that too, all right? So yeah, we always have to do proper bonding, rather, whether it be sandblasting, etching, grinding, whatever it needs to be done to get the bond. Then sometimes we have to put a primer down to make sure we get the bond. Some products, as you were kind of mentioning, are difficult to bond to. Some specific polyethylene plastics it releases very nicely on polyethylene, and in some polypropylene, hard polypropylene, it releases very easily off of, they're hard to bond to. So there are handfuls of products that it's difficult, but most metals and woods and other substrates are, are good when properly prepped, and it's critical it's prepped. Yes? Um, what are like the No, it, it, that's a good point. We do do waterproofing. My home is completely coated, uh, the basement, with the polyurea that you've got. So we also got a good, got, we got any bomb considerations, you can come to our place when we go to the basement. But it's also uh, very, uh, the permeability of the product is very, very low. So it makes a fantastic waterproof product and we use it extensively in that arena. And if you can get a little bomb blast out of it, it doesn't hurt as well. But you know, it is very good waterproofing. Sometimes it's a little too expensive for people's taste because a lot of homes are not adequately waterproof with asphalt base. They wear off over time, ours won't. It's there for good. We probably have time for one more. Okay. So you could line X a roof. You could line X a roof. I got aesthetic issues with that, okay? But you could, you could, you can. We just got to make it look good, all right? So uh, we've had some people do that. We've had some people literally fully linex their house, the exterior of their house. It's made it look a little stucco-like. I'm not ready to do that, all right? I like brick and I like shingles. Okay, all right? Thank you. Thank you.